this uh, very important subject. So um, most grateful to those of you who have joined us and of course to our panel members um, today and welcome everybody on behalf of Redline Consulting, but also thanking very much um, Redline Chambers for their support in, in uh, publicizing and hosting this event uh, this evening. Um, I'm delighted to be moderating this important discussion about one of the most important issues and significant issues in an international context, which is affecting us at this time. Um, the issue of accountability in the context of war crimes, uh, which are taking place, place tragically on a daily basis in Ukraine. Um, and how do we hold those who are responsible to account for their actions domestically and internationally? Uh, the recourse to international legal mechanisms has been extraordinary in recent weeks and months. We've seen the ICJ, European Court of Human Rights and the International Criminal Court all being activated by starting and instigating proceedings, uh, which could be regarded as a validation of those systems in a sense, notwithstanding the current limits as to how they operate on the ground. But we know war crime cases are notoriously difficult to prove and prosecute, even with the right evidence and with eyewitness accounts, and even the murder of civilians may not present a clear cut case. The international legal basis for prosecution is not universally accepted and defendants um, see that context, intent and geopolitics matter. And as a result of these complications, uh, defendants can wait decades to face any form of justice. Events in Ukraine provide the catalyst for this session, but we are looking at the issues more broadly uh, notably practical issues faced when investigating and considering war crimes in both a contemporaneous and a historic context. And we're considering the creative ways of addressing the gaps when perhaps existing legal mechanisms may be inadequate. I'd like to now introduce our distinguished panel this evening, uh, and we'll do so very briefly in the interests of time rather than giving their full resume, um, because each of them is a very accomplished uh, practitioner. Um, and each of their detailed profiles can be found on the RLC Redline Consulting website. So first of all, Serena Gates is a barrister and member of Redline Chambers. She has extensive experience investigating war crimes and human rights abuses and has provided training and capacity building in conflict and post-conflict environments, notably in relation to Syria, Myanmar and South Sudan. She has extensive experience on the ground in conflict and post-conflict locations over the last 18 years. Mark Guthrie is a member of Redline Consulting and also a barrister. He has served as a, of a senior human rights officer and rule of law legal advisor in the OSCE mission to Bosnia-Herzegovina, analyzing and advising on the domestic prosecution of war crimes advising out of the, arising excuse me, out of the conflict in Bosnia-Herzegovina. He also supervised trial monitoring projects in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Sorry, I'm having difficulty pronouncing this evening. Um, Mike Anderson next works at Coots Bank in the sports, media and entertainment divisions. Um, but the reason we were inviting him here today is because of his rather brilliant book, The Ticket Collector from Belarus, which is uh, about the only successful UK prosecution of a World War II Nazi war criminal, uh, and Andre um, Savonyak at the Old Bailey in 1999. Um, another pronunciation conundrum for me. Um, finally, last but not least, uh, Arif Abraham is a barrister at Garden Court North Chambers. He specializes in public international law, international criminal law and human rights and is the founder of Accountability Unit, uh, an NGO specializing in conflict resolution and justice issues. He's previously worked at the UNICTY, um, the tribunal for former Yugoslavia, Public International Law and Policy Group in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and the European Court of Human Rights. So I'll now ask each of our guests this evening to speak about their experience in this context of the session tonight, and then we'll have time for some questions and answers and an interactive discussion with uh, 10 minutes at the end for you and the audience to put in your questions. I'd ask if, you, if I can that you put it into the Q&A box. Uh, we'll monitor those throughout and come to them. Um, at the end, with the one exception, if you have a question following Serena's talk, because she's going first, um, please do ask that sooner rather than later, because for the interest of time, she has to go earlier than our other guests. Um, so just before six. So please bear that in mind, should you have a, a specific question for Serena. Okay, so I'm going to turn over to Serena next um, for her to set out 
uh, current issues around uh, obviously what's happening in Ukraine and some of the challenges around investigating and documenting war crimes in particular. So Serena, if I may, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I think when we think about the current focus uh, on war crimes prosecutions and investigations, it's important to see it in the light of what's happened um, in the last few years and the frustration with the lack of accountability that we've seen in more recent conflicts, such as Syria, for example. Um, and in part, that was due, certainly in the Syrian context, to um, a lack of access and a lack of cooperation at the national level. Uh, and the distinction that we have, obviously, in Ukrainian context is that we do have cooperation um, from the government in Ukraine with the international community, such that there is much more of a greater drive uh, and ability potentially to achieve accountability. Although the routes through that, through which that may be obtained are obviously still up for discussion. Um, I think in relation to Ukraine, we're going to see a a playing out in a much a more significant context than we have today to the principle of complementarity in the sense that you know, we have already seen um, the ICC initiate investigations in relation to Ukraine. Obviously, Ukraine's not a party to the Rome Statute, um, but Ukraine has already uh, it has no ability to refer crimes to the ICC. But of course, it's already exercised its prerogative um, to accept the ICC's jurisdiction over crimes under the Rome Statute committed on its territory. Uh, and other states, particularly um, since the events of February this year, have referred potential crimes to the ICC. So, so we will see, obviously, some form um, of accountability occurring in an ICC context. As to what crimes um, any ICC case may choose to indict remains to be seen, but inevitably, they will focus on the gravest of crimes with potentially parallel prosecutions occurring in different tribunals uh, and as we're already starting to see in Ukraine itself. Um, one of the issues we have I think in a number of contexts and we see this in places like South Sudan and other countries where there is pressure to prosecute um, war crimes is that it's much easier for national jurisdictions to prosecute crimes such as simple crimes of murder and rape rather than indicting things as war crimes within their national courts. Um, and that is a common source of frustration, I think, for accountability um, on the international stage, in part because um, simple criminal acts such as murder and rape, I say simple, I mean not indicting them as war crimes, I think potentially reduces um, the severity with which they're regarded by both um, victims, witnesses, and the international community. So that is something um, to bear in mind. The, um, in Ukraine, the national courts do have um, the capability to prosecute effectively breaches of the Geneva Convention. Um, there isn't as yet an International Crimes Act um, that would perhaps make things more straightforward, but potentially breaches of the Geneva Convention can be prosecuted in the national courts. And we could see that sort of thing starting to happen in parallel with high level um, trials, either at the ICC or other international or hybrid tribunals. And I know um, Arif is going to talk about some options in relation to that in due course. Sometimes I think people wonder, well, what's the rationale for complementarity? Why have um, cases occurring in the national courts uh, as well? And I think where there is the capacity to do that, and it's not always easy because you don't always have the expertise at the national level. And that is often why um, international assistance is both requested and offered. Um, but I think it's important to remember that achieving justice in locations that are closer for the victims and witnesses in what may often be a more timely fashion um, can be helpful in achieving justice and for justice to be seen to be done by those operating at the local level. I think one of the frustrations that you often encounter when you interview victims and witnesses on the ground in conflict and particularly um, you know, when conflicts are still ongoing, is that the prospect of accountability at an international tribunal 
many years down the line doesn't feel like justice to them at, at the time. Um, and the mechanisms which allow a, perhaps a slightly lower level justice to be achieved more quickly um, can help, I think, um, a country and a society move forward, um, particularly if they get to the point where they are seeking to transition out of conflict. And I think that's important um, to bear in mind. Can I, can I ask you, sorry, Serena, because I just, a question's occurred to me immediately within the context of domestic prosecutions, which I think, well, I imagine other people might think, how can there be guarantees of a fair trial whilst war is ongoing in a jurisdiction where a national prosecution, as we've seen in the last you know, few days, um, how, how do we know due process has been followed? I think that that is a challenge and it's a, a very valid question. I think there's a number of mechanisms that can be put in place to try and um, increase the prospects of, of a fair trial. Uh, and one of those is having you know, international observers uh, at any such trial. Um, and I think the other thing that helps is that whenever there's a conflict, inevitably there ends up being wrongdoing by both sides. Uh, and I think that, you know, in order to show impartiality in prosecutions, um, people have to prosecute whatever comes to light committed um, by either party to the conflict. Uh, and that is one of the important ways to show objectivity by a prosecuting agency. Sorry, I didn't wish to interrupt. No, no, that's all right. Go there, but it just occurred to me, if you imagine a country that's still at war and in, in, a, in a scenario where you, you know, appreciate Ukraine may not be in this sort of situation, but if you had a jury, you've got, you know, the defending counsel, and it's a very emotionally fraught situation to imagine that you'd ever get anything other than uh, one outcome. Although I, I recognise in the recent example, we've seen the first, the first trial in, in Ukraine, it, it was a guilty plea, but there are, it does beg questions, I think, for... Uh, lay people questioning how, how justice is truly being achieved in, in different contexts. No, I agree, but I think we also have to remember these prosecutions are already happening, mm. uh, and therefore it's a case of, you know, how, how can we ensure the highest of standards are implemented, um, if not maintained? Uh, and so when one sort of prosecutes something, I think as a war crime, there's additional elements that need to be proved it makes people approach it in a slightly more considered way than perhaps simply indicting things as, as murder and rape. Um, but I think you know, that is one of the challenges that we face in a lot of these countries because you will often have the political incumbents bringing cases um, against what may be atrocities committed by former or current opposition. Um, and that is you know, a scenario that we see in lots of different countries. I, previously did some work in relation to Uganda, where we had a, a case going on um, at the ICC, um, the prosecution of Dominic Ongwin, a former commander in the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, and then you had, at the same time, going on in the Specialist International Crimes Division of the High Court in Uganda, prosecution of lower level commanders, um, starting from the Lord's Resistance Army. But again, one of the criticisms from society are, why is it only members of the Lord's Resistance Army being prosecuted and not members of government forces. So I, I fully take on board your points there, and I think it's a valid one that has to be addressed going forward. Um, but just very briefly, I've also been asked to comment on some of the challenges in documenting and investigating war crimes in the current context. Uh, and there are obvious security challenges um, in what is a live conflict, and inevitably um, it's easier to investigate uh, once areas calm down and, and fighting ceases in any particular district. Um, but the issues I think that we're starting to see more and more in current conflicts is um, the issue of where there has been a lack of access, particularly by the international community, we start to see a bigger role being played by civil society in the documentation and investigation of war crimes. Uh, and the advent of mobile phones and social media allows the capture of potential evidence in a much greater way than has been um, carried out before. But inevitably, whoever goes in to then formally investigate cases ends up um, documenting, investigating, taking witness statements. Uh, and in many scenarios, I think that we are in danger of ending up with over-documentation. Um, and this is a, something that occurred certainly in a Syrian context as well. Uh, and may well occur in a Ukrainian context, but I don't think we'll really see the problems that that causes until some of these matters play out 
at trials where you start to see sort of inconsistent versions of events by different persons uh, and that sort of problem. So I think um, it also leads to victim fatigue where the same people are being spoken to multiple times by journalists, by civil society, et cetera. Um, whereas uh, I, I don't think we used to see this to the same extent we do now. So um, just to, to bring that together, I think it sort of leads to the point as to what happens to all this evidence. And there are certainly increasing efforts um, for coordination at the international level um, for depositories of evidence. We've seen that um, with Myanmar, we've seen that with Syria, we're seeing it with the newly announced conflict observatory in relation to open source material for Ukraine. Um, and that is a very useful resource on which the international tribunals can draw. But I think one has to be aware that at the national level, um, it's a big challenge to be able to coordinate that level of information. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And one can only imagine the potential disclosure issues that could also arise from this, which we've which we've been witnessing unfold in, in well, certainly the last decade or two. Um, OK, well, thank you so much, Serena. Um, I don't know if you have to leave just yet. There haven't been any questions that have come through uh, the Q&A box. Um, but I, I think I'm, as far as, as unless any of the uh, other panel members have any thoughts or observations following what you've just been talking about, um, we can otherwise release you <laughs> to your next meeting, which I which I know you need to get to. Um, but most grateful for your uh, extremely interesting and, and helpful contribution to our discussion this evening. Thank you. Um, I would love to go on next to speak with um, Mike Anderson, who I've introduced previously as having written the book, The Ticket Collector uh, from Belarus. And um, Mike, I'd like to hear a little bit more if, if we can about your uh, rationale for writing the book, uh, how you became engaged with that, some of the background to the, um, the defendant in that case, and, and, and other thoughts you may have on how and why uh, this was the first war crimes prosecution in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, yes, thank you very much, and uh, privileged to uh, to be joined in this uh, this panel. Um, a little bit about the book, first of all, on the basis that uh, most people probably haven't read my book. Um, but at the heart of the book, and what actually started for me uh, on the project, was the trial in 1999. Um, you know, that really caught my attention, and I'll explain why. Um, and that's really at the heart of the book. And it's about the trial of Anthony or Andrei Savonyuk, um, which started in February 1999, finished two months later. Um, and uh, the defendant was charged for multiple murders uh, that had taken place 57 years before, um, not in the UK, but in Domachevo, which was um, a small town in Belarus, which was actually then in Poland. Um, the ticket collected from Belarus tells the story of Savonyuk, and he became a local policeman in Domachevo several days after the invasion of the East by, uh, by the Germans in Operation Barbarossa. Um, quickly volunteered uh, and became also very quickly a willing executioner and was involved actively in the murder of all but 13 of the town's Jewish population of about 5,000 and also the uh, involved in the death of many more, you know, accused of being partisans, innocent bystanders and so on. So uh, he had the, um, the blood on his hands of thousands of people. Um, and um, one of the witnesses at the trial commented to one of the policemen that Savonyuk had killed more people than the hairs on the policeman's head. So, um, you know, an extraordinary story. Um, he was promoted to the head of the police uh, and he was made uh, promoted to be a corporal of a Waffen SS unit. Um, and then in the closing months of the war, um, as the Russians advanced and the Germans retreated, he retreated with them and um, swapped sides in the closing months of the war, joined the Free Polish Army, um, and along with thousands of others, um, you know, thousands of others, uh, Waffen SS members and uh, other Nazis came to the UK um, and he became a ticket collector for British Rail at London Bridge Station. So, um, you know, managed to get a, a gold watch after long service for British Rail um, and nobody knew about him until the Russians released a list of names in 1988 
of um, Nazis that the Russians believed were living in the UK. And his name was on that list. And for interesting reasons, it took a long time to find him. Uh, but he was successfully prosecuted. Why did I become involved in it? Um, probably the first interest in this was uh, actually that my headmaster's wife was in the concentration camp. So um, I became very conscious about the Holocaust from an early age. Um, and for the trial itself, uh, a friend of mine was the junior counsel for the prosecution. So I followed the trial in 1999. Um, and 10 years later, we were having dinner. And I said, you must have so many people chasing you about this story. And he said, quite the opposite. No one has ever approached me to talk to me about this trial. He talked about it with the defence and prosecuting barristers who had said the same. So here was a story that I felt needed to be investigated, a unique British Holocaust story. Um, and uh, the, the more that I became involved in it, you know, the more I found out. And one of the other interesting aspects was that there was a parallel life in it, which is the only Jewish witness in the trial, one of the 13 survivors, um, because he and Zavonik had been best friends when they were when they were young. So here was a personal story. Um, and the final point that um, I wanted to say was that, um, you know, here I am approaching 60. Um, and if I was to speak to a 15 year old, there's obviously a 45 year old, power, so there's obviously a 45 year differential between myself and the 15 year old, you know, but when I think about it, in the difference between the end of the Second World War and the Boer War was also 45 years. So for that 15 year old, you know, the Second World War was ancient history, as I might feel about the Boer War. So having the actuality told in modern London in 1999, you know, double decker buses, black taxis, would hopefully make people realise that, you know, the Second World War, the Holocaust happened in living memory. So I think that probably answers the first question. Uh, the second question that you've asked, you know, uh, why was this the first and last Nazi to be prosecuted in the UK? Um, I think as far as the first is concerned, um, you know, the actual locus for prosecutions, you know, in the immediately after the war was Nuremberg trials. Um, there were trials in British occupied parts of Germany. There was the option of deportations um, and so on. And, um, and I think, you know, immediately after the war, um, first of all, the country, Britain was a broken country. Um, there was at that stage, you know, probably a quarter of a million Eastern Europeans living in the UK um, who filled the gap of manpower. Um, and, uh, you know, with many men obviously killed or injured in the Second World War. Um, and uh, that was regarded as being a good way of filling the gap. Um, you know, as opposed to, you know, there's certainly racism involved in this, as opposed to uh, Asians, Blacks, and indeed Jews, uh, who were less welcome. Um, there was also fatigue. Um, and Winston Churchill, Churchill himself said, you know, we need to put the past behind us and move towards the future. So I think, therefore, there was a period of several decades where the question of uh, war crimes wasn't really pursued. Um, until uh, 1986, when the Summon Wiesenthal Centre submitted a list of 17 Nazis believed to be living in the UK, and that was supplemented by the list of um, nearly 100 Nazis that the Russians added to that list. Um, and uh, therefore, special legislation had to be passed because uh, there was no jurisdiction to prosecute people who had committed crimes uh, of murder or manslaughter. Um, outside of the UK. So specific legislation was passed in 1991. Um, and uh, by the time that uh, Zafoniak's crime, sorry, trial came across, it was 47 years, sorry, correct me, 57 years after the trial. So I think the reason that it was the last was that, first of all, very difficult to prosecute these cases. Uh, and uh, at this stage, very difficult also to find victims. As a matter of fact, um, a Nazi hunter in 2014 identified uh, a member of the SS who died only in 19, sorry, in 2013. So he could have been found if other prosecutions had been pursued, uh, but they weren't. And I think that was partly uh, political will.
or a lack of political will. Yeah, I mean, I know that you mentioned in your book, which I thoroughly recommend, incidentally, it's a very moving and, and harrowing uh, account of both the, the context, the situation, and then, of course, the trial itself. But the background, I think, is is very vividly described, Mike. But I think, you know, the, the concern is that it was resource intensive. You had an actual site visit to the uh, town in, in, in Belarus, and that was obviously for members of the jury to see where the events had unfolded. And there's also questions, as you say, around the type of evidence that was available, which we know in the current context of what's happening in Ukraine will be very different. And we, we heard from Serena about the enormous amounts of documentation and video evidence that's available. Um, so essentially, it, it was quite incredible there was any conviction at all based on very, very old testimony, eyewitness accounts from 57 years back. Yeah, the, uh, the, best, the best witness for the prosecution in this particular trial wasn't the actual witnesses themselves, it was Savonyuk himself, mm. you know, against um, his defence's um, advice, he took the stand. And I think, you know, the jury saw through him and they saw that he was guilty, whatever he might say. Yeah, his evidence was uh, peppered with inconsistencies and untruths. And so that clearly didn't didn't help the case from obviously the critical credibility perspective. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a fascinating um, story on, on so many levels. I'll come back to you in a moment, um, Mike, if I may, um, but, but just conscious of time, I, I'd now like to come on to, to Mark, um, who has ex experience, as we've mentioned, in, in Bosnia and, and working um, and advising on prosecutions in that jurisdiction. Mark, perhaps if you could cover you know, what you've done and, and the sorts of challenges that you've experienced during your time as a special advisor in this area. Yeah, well, I was <clears throat> involved nearly 20 years ago when a new criminal procedure code came into force in, in Bosnia, which um, introduced the crime of crimes against humanity into the criminal code for Bosnia and a new criminal procedure code and the establishment of a, a new state court in, in Bosnia. And when there was a concerted effort to uh, prosecute war crimes cases in, in, in that country. I think that there are four points which I would make arising out of my experience and which may be relevant for the prosecution of war crimes cases in, in Ukraine. And they're these. The first is, is the need to identify a strategy for prosecuting uh, war crimes. And I know that there's talk that they've identified potentially 10,000 war crimes cases in Ukraine. So there's going to have to be some strategy developed of how you're going to deal with those cases. In the, in, in, in the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, most people know of the existence of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and The Hague. But what's less known is, is that the ICTY's jurisdiction over war crimes and the Yugoslav um, conflict was concurrent with that of the, of the domestic courts. And since 2004, the domestic courts in Bosnia-Herzegovina have tried around about 600 cases. And, we, and that's been divided between the state court in Sarajevo and the local courts, local courts which would have an equivalent jurisdiction to the Crown Court in this country. And so there has to be some kind of criteria for deciding where, which cases get tried where. And so they've introduced, they first started looking at of, of categorizing cases, whether they were sen highly sensitive and sensitive and then moved on to changing those categories to complex and less complex. And it, it's, it's proved problematic um, in people's understanding of what is complex and what's less complex. Um, so that's not been a difficult, that's not been an easy cr criteria, easy to, to apply. The second point um, I'd make is, is that the decision-making process is very important. Which cases do you do you prosecute? In Bosnia, the, exist, the existence of a prosecutorial discretion is not the same as it is in this country. Um, 
generally speaking, prosecutors in, in, in Bosnia have to decide whether there is sufficient su suspicion that an offence may have been committed before they must make a decision whether to order an investigation. Um, and various and uh, thereafter prosecutors can decide whether to cease an investigation but if they find that there is sufficient evidence um, for to grounds to believe that someone has committed an offense well then they must raise an indictment and this sort of ties in with what Serena was saying is the challenge is is to um, make a decision to investigate and um, prosecute cases um, where uh, you, you may, on the face of it, have a sympathy for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, for the person under suspicion. Um, and so you have, and, and so the question arises, you know, are, are the decisions being made on strictly legal um, on strictly legal grounds, and so the, the third point which I'd make is is, is that however good as however however comprehensive your strategy it is, it's dependent on the quality of the people um, or who are going to implement it, and for that reason you really do need to have independent, uh, technically excellent. Um, and impartial prosecutors of integrity who are going to investigate cases and make a decision um, whether to whether to prosecute. Um, and, and equally, you need to have independent judges um, who are going to try those cases. And when the war crimes were being prosecuted, when that process started, um, in Bosnia, it went hand in hand with a new process to appoint um, judges in, 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 um, in an independent manner um, with a view to ensuring that um, they were appointing independent and impartial judges and the, say, the same for prosecutors. And so the fourth point leads me back to what I said about there being about 10,000 cases in Ukraine. Well, as I say, since 2004, 600 cases have been prosecuted in Bosnia, and there's probably about an equal number of cases um, which are outstanding. And under the current war crimes prosecuting strategy, they're supposed to complete those by, by next year. Um, they're just not going to meet that deadline. And so it indicates that um, this is a, a long drawn out process which um, in my view needs three things. Uh, the first is political will, and Mike touched upon that as the reason for bringing war crimes prosecutions. The second is, is the need um, for plenty of resources, both human and financial. This requires a huge amount of effort. And thirdly, um, the need for international support for the process. Wow, that sounds exhausting. <laughs> 10,000, the prospect of 10,000 uh, cases and undoubtedly, you know, we're only a very limited period into this uh, mm. conflict, so there will be more and more growing. Um, and, and this is where, I mean, again, feeding back into what Serena was saying about the sheer volume of evidence, this is a gargantuan task for, um, for, for lawyers to, to manage and, and for prosecution agencies, uh, whether domestic or international. So there is a a serious need for a strategy in due course, but absolutely take on your points, um, Mark. I, I'm gonna come across to Arif now um, before we go through the, the sort of questions to everybody. Um, for, for you to cover, Arif, if I may, some of the ideas or a particular idea that, that you're um, working on to perhaps provide uh, a, a more inventive solution to these issues, not just pure reliance on existing mechanisms, but another op option. Um, so over to you, Arif. Thank you. If I can uh, begin by thanking, first of all, um, Sarah for this invitation, um, Professor Philippe Sands for connecting us, and also Red Lion Consulting for being um, today's um, generous hosts. Uh, in, in the time that I have, I would like to make really three short points. Um, the first 
point is to outline why accountability for the crime of aggression, as opposed to other international crimes, um, can only be really ensured by setting up a new, or what you might consider a special tribunal for Ukraine. Um, second, identify some of the precedents that may help formulate an agreement or a statute for a special tribunal. And third, consider really the practicality in setting up a special tribunal and some perhaps challenges uh, in light of critique of creating a new institution. Um, to start with my first point, um, as many of us know on this call, um, on the 24th of February of this year, Russia in concert with Belarus began an unjustified, wanton and destructive attack on Ukraine. Now that attack was long preceded by um, firstly, the illegal annexation of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol in 2014, and later the region of Donbass um, through the use of um, mercenaries and um, separatists at the instigation of um, the Russian state. Now, Russia's use of force against a sovereign Ukrainian state constitutes one or more illegal acts of aggression contrary to binding international law having neither been authorized by the UN Security Council, nor it being an act of self-defense. Now, aggression is considered a leadership crime. So those exercising control over or directing political or military action of the acts, in the words of um, the 1946 Nuremberg Tribunal, are committing the supreme international crime. And the reason for that is that all other international crimes such as war crimes, crimes against humanity, or genocide, are often facilitated by armed conflicts and illegal ones at that. So as the aggression against Ukraine continues, currently there is no international body before which those responsible in Russia or Belarus can be brought before. Russia, as Serena has indicated earlier, is not a state party to the International Criminal Court, which is the only international body that could try serving high officials who are responsible. A referral to the International Criminal Court by the UN Security Council would of course be vetoed by Russia, which is a permanent member. And so essentially it's because of this vacuum, a lack of a tribunal, that a special uh, tribunal would help enforce binding international law relating to aggression, and it would be complementary to, rather than in competition with the International Criminal Court. This brings me to my second point. What are the precedents for something like this? Um, I've identified approximately 25 relevant agreements since the 1929 kellogg brien Pact, which is often cited as essentially the precedent for the prosecution of German and Japanese leaders after the Second World War. Now, of those 25, 10 are particularly relevant, and those are the agreements that set up um, various courts or tribunals since the Second World War. Just as, a, as an example, um, there's obviously the 1945 Charter, an agreement on the international military tribunals, of course, in Tokyo and Nuremberg, the 93 and 94 statutes in Rwanda and Yugoslavia, which um, Mark has just referred to in, in the case of Bosnia. Obviously, the 1998 Rome Statute, which set up the International Criminal Court and later in 2010 extended the jurisdiction of that agreement to the crime of aggression. 2002 agreement between the UN and Sierra Leone for its special court. Uh, 2003, Cambodia and the UN set up the Extraordinary Chambers. 2007, UN and Lebanon on the Special Tribunal. 2012, um, a, a unique, relatively unique, but interesting agreement between the African Union and Senegal uh, on the extraordinary African chambers within the Senegalese judicial system, which um, famously tried successfully prosecuted um, his, his, Hissan Habre um, and various others, as I mentioned. So with these international precedents, how does one go about creating a special tribunal? Now, an agreement uh, slash a statute for a special tribunal can be between um, the UN and Ukraine on recommendation from the UN General Assembly in the absence of a UN Security Council referral. 
Now, of course, a General Assembly providing a recommendation would give significant legis legitimacy to a future tribunal. The tribunal could consist of a hybridized chamber within the Ukrainian court system. And the precedent for that is, of course, the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, which incidentally wasn't created by the UN Security Council, but upon recommendation by the UN General Assembly. Or a freestanding hybrid tribunal could be set up like the Special Court for the Sierra Leone, um, which was created by the UN Security Council, but critically not under Chapter 7. How would jurisdiction be derived for a special tribunal? Well, firstly, and predominantly, it would be derived from under Ukrainian law, which proscribes the crime of aggression as does incidentally the Russian and Belarus criminal codes. It's possible also to pool universal jurisdiction of various states that provide for universal jurisdiction of the, of the crime of aggression and also reliance on general international law. There's an argument to be had that actually the crime of aggression not, not only is a peremptory norm of international law, but it is proscribed by custom and therefore um, jurisdiction derived from the Ukrainian domestic statutes could be supplemented by virtue of custom through international law. So the General Assembly is essentially one route. Um, a more realistic option politically perhaps is an agreement between Ukraine and the EU following the Kosovo um, Specialist Chambers precedent. Uh, and that of course has been made what might be considered to be a natural progression, partly because this week um, the EU Parliamentary Assembly had passed a resolution uh, endorsing the creation of a special tribunal and already three uh, and increasingly more states have signed up to what's called the Joint Investigative Team under the EU auspices, which has already started investigation for uh, the crime of aggression, in addition to other international crimes being committed on the territory of the Ukraine. An alternative and increasingly a possible one following very loosely the African Union Senegal precedent would be a regional tribunal where an agreement could be formed between Ukraine and the Council of Europe. Uh, and it's similarly, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe two weeks ago also endorsed the creation of such a tribunal. The two um, alternatives here are a simply essentially a treaty between an ad hoc group of states and Ukraine, a coalition of the willing, if you might, with, with the possibility of future endorsement by others, including international or regional organizations. And then finally, perhaps the most unrealistic option, even though commentators have suggested it, is an amendment to the Rome Statute itself in respect of the jurisdiction of the crime of aggression, which would, of course, raise all sorts of issues of retroactivity, but also just the political will of various states who'd opposed having an expansive definition of the crime of aggression including wide jurisdiction. So to essentially conclude, we know that obviously agreement in international, with international organizations or regional organizations take time. But in my view and the view of some of us who've been working on creating a special tribunal, a very first step could already begin uh, the work of a special tribunal in earnest with a coalition of the willing through an interim or a preparatory prosecution office. Um, Alex Whiting, a respected uh, international prosecutor, has identified that actually the cost of an interim uh, prosecution office would be very minimal. Um, a Ukrainian advisor to the foreign ministry had suggested it would be the cost of a Russian tank for a single year um, in terms of setting up an interim prosecution office manned with um, relevant expertise. And I would say that the sooner that work begins, the more likely that the creation of a special tribunal would become an inevitability as opposed to one of political expediency. Uh, thank you. I'd be happy to answer some questions. Thank you, Arif. I mean, I had two questions just, just drawing out from what you've said, and um, one of those was where the UK is, is standing on this, for those of our uh, listeners who perhaps aren't familiar with the proposal. Um, and, and the second is, which one do you think is most likely? I mean, you've given a sort of spectrum of possibilities, and I'm, I'm curious, I think you've, you've alluded to two or three that might be more likely than others, certainly the, the least realistic at the end was the amendment to the Rome Statute, but, but out of the, the others, where does your instinct tell you, if you, if you can say, 
we yeah. might end up. So really just those two points, most likely, and where's the UK? Well, well since this initiative really began, actually behead, at the behest of um, Philippe Sands, and then very quickly followed up by uh, Ukraine's foreign ministry, um, there has been a lot of interest in setting up this tribunal, particularly, of course, by states that neighbor Russia and have been impacted by Russian acts of various sorts in, in the past decade or so. You, uh, the UK has been initially a little bit hesitant, cautious as to endorsing such a tribunal. But as of last week, the foreign secretary has indicated that she's actively considering this and has discussed the option of a special tribunal with her Ukrainian counterpart. Um, there were some signals initially that the, the objections emanating from the UK Foreign Office was that either this would be too costly or it, or it would be in competition with the ICC. Those objections, I think, have largely fallen away, partly because it's been demonstrated that really the cost would be so minimal and the number of people needed so few that actually this could be done very quickly at short notice, especially the first phase of such a tribunal. And, and the, the legitimacy argument has also kind of fallen, fallen away in the sense that the Ukrainians have asked for this. Uh, the Ukrainian president, the foreign minister and civil society have, have, have backed this. And, and I think that's what's really led to a change of heart in, in the UK and the ICC complementarity point. I mean, it completely falls away because the ICC can't be seized of jurisdiction for the crime of aggression. So in a way, it really complements the work of ICC in respect of other international crimes. And um, what is the most likely option in terms of an agreement? I mean, it's difficult to say, partly because support has been so wide. You might even say surprisingly wide. As I've said, the EU and Council of Europe parliamentary assemblies have backed this in the Council of Europe unanimously. So that's 47 countries since Russia was kicked out. Now that is unprecedented. Um, the question is, could you get more? You, you, you may have European interests, but could you do one better, so to speak, and say, actually, could this also, in addition to being a European-centered focused initiative, actually could be a global um, initiative, which might also provide a signal to other states to say, actually, the crime of aggression will not be tolerated any longer. And that would be the ideal scenario that not only does the Council of Europe Europe endorsed this or the EU initially, but actually leaving open the possibility that the General Assembly itself might um, ratify a possible agreement in the future by a majority. Mm. Yeah, no, it's it's fascinating to think of the the options that might lie ahead, but also that it, I guess it's not just the cost which may be minimal to this, it's, it's, it's the different costs of the different activities that all may be simultaneously underway, which create the collective uh, financial burden. But arguably, that's nothing compared to the collective human burden of not taking action. Um, so I, I, think, I think perhaps we could go on to the questions. We've got 10 minutes left before the end and currently no Q&A in the box other than whether the recording would be available at a later point. And yes, it will be, it will be available on the website. So for anyone who wishes to reference it uh, on social media or, or recommend, that would be really helpful. And absolutely within the next, I believe 24 hours or so, uh, recordings will be available. Um, I think it would be good to, to consider now, if I may, um how well i suppose i suppose the question that i just want to go on to forgive me i'm just looking at my notes because in some of your presentations you've covered some of the initial questions i had in mind um and i think that includes our if um what i was going to ask you about the lithuanian uh international conference that you, i think you attended uh in may uh, a couple of weeks ago where participants were urging the international community to take prompt action so i my query around that was how how did those who participated in engage in this concept of a special tribunal as a possible solution on top of everything else that's going on but i i think unless there's anything else that you want to add to what you've said in this area um was there anything else that was observed at that event? Um, I, I think less so on, on the idea of supporting the tribunal, but, but I guess the focus really was on the mechanics, exactly how would this work? What would be the jurisdictional basis? Um, 
how would practicalities of apprehending perpetrators work? Um, so it was really the, the technical details, which I guess shows in many ways the willingness and, and the support that is there for a tribunal such as this. I mean, I think the things that came to the fore was the resource argument, mm -hmm. charges of selectivity, you know, why this and why not Iraq? Um, uh, and so I think those were some of the challenges, but I think a lot of the participants had answered those to a sufficient level where we are seeing that support that wasn't previously available that is actually now coming on board. And I think previously we, we spoke about this question of selectivity, um, certainly when you and I spoke in the build up to this event today. Um, do you have anything else that you or perhaps Mark or anyone else might want to add about why do we as an international community respond so quickly and with so much vigor to what's happening now where perhaps the arguments we've seen from from some in civil society are that we're not as quick or as um, active when it comes to other atrocity crimes in different jurisdictions. Sarah, Sarah can I just say there is a question in Q&A? Yeah, okay, thank you. Sorry, I was looking at my- I'd give um, priority to, rather okay. than hearing from me. <laughs> Well, I, was, I, th I still think it's an important point on the selectivity question, because I know it's been raised in the media a few times. So I think um, perhaps we'll come back to that to enable the questions to be answered here. Um, an anonymous attendee has asked, would any ad hoc tribunal trying the crime of aggression allow for trial in absence? And if not, what prospects are there of getting any defendant before the court? Do you want to go first, Mark, and uh, then anyone else might step in? Uh, well, I think that's more for Arif, that one, on the... Okay. On, on the... I'm, I'm happy with whichever <laughs> question is suitable for anybody. Um, Arif? But very quickly, I think there's a difference of opinion on, on how, on whether or not to have trials in absentia. Of course, there's been the recent precedent of the Lebanese um, uh, uh, special tribunal in The Hague, which allowed for um, trials in absentia. And of course, there were no people who were apprehended and that was a costly exercise. So I think in, in a sense, practitioners have been burnt with this issue relatively recently. So there's great hesitancy to have trials in absentia, also issues with relating to fair trials. Um, I think I would defer this question for the reason I set out earlier that actually a, a tribunal could be in two parts. You can have a prosecution office processing evidence, pre preparing case files, um, filing indictments, and then actually it can go into hiatus. It can it can it can sit there until um, perpetrators are apprehended, and then it can be put into motion, not dissimilar to the Kosovo Specialist Chambers, in order to be just there as and when required when perpetrators are apprehended. And that might be the most practical option, as well as ensuring that you have due process and fair trial rights. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mark, would you like to answer the second question here we've got, which was, does the panel have any novel suggestions on how to openly and transparently handle the inevitable war crime appeals in the future? Well, that's a great question. I'm not sure if I have any novel answers <laughs> to that. Um, you know, when they established the, the state court in, in, in Bosnia in the early 2000s, it started off with um, international judges and it took in over a decade before um, there were national, it became entirely staffed by, by national judges. So I, I suppose one thing that you might consider would be having some international component for any appeal process. But then, you know, if you're, if you're prosecuting in the domestic courts in, in Ukraine, one would expect the, um, you know, the appellate courts in Ukraine um, to be to be involved. Now, I don't know, you know, what is what what the criminal procedure is on appeals in in Ukraine, but in the in the in some of the early war crimes trials they had in Bosnia Herzegovina under the um, old criminal procedure code. Um, there was no limit on the number of times um, either parties, either the prosecution or the defence, could appeal. And um, we had a case in Mostar, um, it was the Mostar 4, 
where there were just constant appeals. Um, either side would appeal. And the, uh, the process was that you would have a, a, re, a new trial every time. Um, and that went on for over a decade, um, raising the question of, you know, whether it was an abuse of process, really, whether it would be an abuse of process mm. to keep trying people um, in relation to events which, you know, which were going much in, in, in the past. So I'm not sure that I have any novels, you know, answer to that. I suppose the answer would be, you know, if, if there were domestic prosecutions in, in Ukraine, um, unless there were particularly strong reasons, um, you'd expect the Ukrainian appellate courts um, to be involved. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to this. I, perhaps I should, but the appeals mechanism from the ICC, what happens in that context? Is there one? Does anyone know the answer to that? I'll go away and uh, look it up. But I wasn't sure. I mean, that's obviously a sort of ultimate court in some contexts. So where mm. do we go if, if there's a challenge to to what's happened? At the well, that they may have an appeals chamber. They must do. I'm thinking that's what yeah. exactly is, is going through my mind. But it's just a curious one, isn't it? Because in terms mm. of elevated court status, there's it's not it's not immediately obvious. Um, there is one more question, I believe, which is actually really a more of an observation, perhaps, because of the sheer volume of cases that we've already mentioned and the, 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 the time that's going to be required in order to, to bring these cases, uh, to, or to, to bring them into any form of court or tribunal. So I, I guess this brings us back round almost to the point where we, we were talking about Mike's uh, experience and the work on the book you know even 57 years after something's happened we've seen justice albeit in a isolated incident in in certainly that uh example in the uk but um i, I suppose for crimes of this nature it's not like there's a statute of limitations you, you, the, the, ch the chance of you continuing to pursue will will remain until somebody's passed away i assume so that's that's a awful observation in terms of justice being delayed but notwithstanding that it's possible um did, did you have any other thoughts on that mike based on what you saw and what you were aware of um and it's, it's the old adage isn't it uh, justice delayed is justice denied um and in fact uh the police themselves the war crimes unit uh, were very skeptical about um about uh these investigations and prosecutions uh, until they came across you know, the evidence of thousands of, uh, of murders. Uh, that also extends to um, some of the barristers who said that, you know, they were very sceptical as well. But, you know, once the law had been changed, they were required to, to follow it. And as they, you know, investigated the cases and found out more, again, they became committed that this was necessary. So I think, you know, um, you know the, the, there's another adage, isn't there, that, um, you know, it isn't a question about whether it would be... Um, dreadful not to actually prosecute crimes you know but the obscene thing actually would be not to investigate them mm. i've probably said that in the wrong wrong uh, set of words but um but you know again you know people felt very um justified in terms of seeing justice yeah. uh, in this case uh, and also i can say that um there was a party after the trial um and uh, one of the policemen said we've got other crimes that we could have been prosecuted but I think there was a lack of political will. Mm, yeah, mm. I mean that's that's the slightly sour side of, of the of the end of that experience is that others perhaps didn't go on to be looked into, or perhaps it was getting rather too late in terms of those still alive to be able to prosecute. But but there's a whole other story there. I think what's what's clear from this event really and from discussions um, is that the importance of appropriately resourcing whatever mechanisms are being deployed to to bring accountability um, and state will, international will is absolutely critical because I think one of the uh, background observations I've been hearing is that the ICC hasn't perhaps been as well resourced as it might have been and, and maybe looking at the volume that might be coming its way in terms of, uh, of, of cases and activity it, it's going to need it's going to need considerable resource moving forwards, and that's that's an important um, thing states need to commit to. But I, I I'm very grateful. Sorry, Mark, have you got anything? Yeah, just, can I just be very quickly? I mean, the answer to the question is well, very very many years. I mean, as I said, you know, um, nearly thirty years after the end of the Bosnian conflict, there are six hundred cases outstanding, mm. 
Um, and you know, one of the problems is, is that they may be able to categorize cases which are complex and less complex, but within the, that category of complexity, prosecutors in Bosnia have no guidance as to which cases then they should give priority. And that is a problem. Um, and the question is absolutely right. Many of the witnesses may die before justice prevails. And that's, you know, all the Bosnian war crimes cases are dependent on witness testimony and they're all getting old. Um, the one the one advantage, uh, you know, one <coughs> silver lining of the of the pandemic um, has been the greater use of um, video link evidence. Um, you know, for witnesses who are outside Bosnia Herzegovina. So, you know, that's a part of the answer, but a very, very long time. Yeah, and perhaps that will be. Um, you know, and that's why I said that's why I said you need a huge amount of resources to have the number of prosecutors. You know, to have the courts and to have the facilities. Mm -hmm. You know, to try these cases because many of the Bosnian courts. Um, weren't well equipped and it wasn't until the EU gave them money that they had the you know facilities to have witness waiting rooms did, did have the video link um, facilities they just didn't have them before um, so you know that's why I say they need lots of money well it's uh, just gone half six, so our time is up, but I'm really grateful to all of the panel members and speakers who have attended and, of course, everyone that's that's registered and joined. Um, I think we can all agree this is going to be a Herculean task ahead of the international community to uh, bring about true accountability for um, for the war crimes that we're seeing and continue to see. Um, but uh, there is international will, it seems, to certainly do something. So. That's a start, but uh, thank you all for participating and uh, I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.